People are not plaster saints or cartoon characters, as a result, while there are good people out there, plenty of awful ones too, seldom do we encounter people who are either purely good or purely awful. Take one of America's favorite cheeses, which is named after a person who horrible in many ways, or the man who revolutionized libraries, and was also an awful predator who today would be ostracized or even locked up. Following are 20 things about those and other lesser known awful sides of famous people, and events from history. A famous cheese named after an awful landlord. The mildly flavored and slightly sweet Monterey Jack cheese is considered to be an American original because of its origins not in the old world, but in the United States. Highly popular Monterey Jack is a flexible platform that lends itself to a rich and delicious variety of cheeses. When not eaten by itself, it is often flavored with chili peppers and herbs to make pepper jack, marbled with cheddar to produce cheddar jack, or with coldy for coldy jack. If not mixed but simply aged for a longer period, it produces a harder cheese named Dry Jack. The first part of Monterey Jack's name is from Monterey, California, where its earliest versions were first made in the 18th century by Franciscan friars. The second part is named after David Jack's 1822-1909. A shady businessman and awful landlord, he was the first to widely market and popularize Monterey cheese and added his name to the brand to make it Monterey Jack. From the small time to the big leagues. David Jack, who later added an S to his last name to make it Jacks, was born in Scotland in 1822. He emigrated to America when he was 20 years old or so and worked for seven years as a U.S. Army contractor in Virginia and New York. When news of the California gold rush arrived, he sold everything he had, which netted him $1,400, and invested it in revolvers for resale in California. He reached San Francisco in 1849, flipped his firearms for $4,000 in just two days, then headed to the gold mines, but failed to hit a mother load. So Jax returned to San Francisco, got a job in the custom house, and put his $4,000 to work by lending some of it out at interest. The following year he moved to Monterey, then a small town of 1,000 people, where for years he dabbled in a few failed enterprises until 1859, when his fortunes dramatically improved. That year as seen below, he and a lawyer named Delos Rod and Ashley cooked up a shady scheme to swindle Monterey out of 30,000 acres, an awful move that instantly transformed David Jacks into a land baron. A quick swindle made Jacks rich in no time. Monterey hired attorney Delos Rod and Ashley to help legalize its claim to 30,000 acres in on the Monterey Peninsula that included the town itself, plus its surroundings, he did and billed the town $991,50 for his legal services. Monterey's treasury was empty, however, so Ashley suggested that it auction off the land to pay him, and keep the rest of the proceeds. Unbeknownst to the good people of Monterey, they were about to fall victim to an awful swindle. Ashley had conspired with David Jacks to rig the auction. The auction was advertised in a newspaper as legally required, but at short notice and not in Monterey, but in Santa Cruz, nearly 50 miles and a two or three day journey away as a result. The only two bidders present at the auction on February 9, 1859, were David Jacks and Delos Ashley. Monterey's lawyer then proceeded to purchase the entire tract for $1,002.50. After the lawyer deducted his legal fee, Monterey was presumably left $11 for its entire 30,000 acres, unless even that went to Ashley as interest for the late payment of his bill. The awful owner of Monterey. Understandably, the town of Monterey was less than happy with the swindle and sought to undo the shady auction. They appealed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, but to no avail. A few years after the con, Delos Ashley sold the entire tract to his co conspirator. David Jacks thus became one of California's biggest proprietors, owner of 30,000 scenic and magnificent acres that surrounded Monterey, as well as the town itself. He proved to be an awful landlord, he charged high rents foreclosed often, and engaged in many shady practices to acquire even more land. Without bothering to notify proprietors, he paid back taxes on properties, then socked the owners with high interest to get their land back. He also foreclosed on defaulted mortgages, and to minimize the chance of having the foreclosures contested, he pinned the notices in hard-to-spot parts of the properties. He also posted them in English if the owners were Mexican, and in Spanish if they were English speakers. Monterey's Most Hated Man Thanks to his shady practices, 
David Jacks eventually came to own about 100,000 acres in Monterey County and its surroundings. Understandably, the locals hated his guts. They went so far as to form a league, which wrote him in 1872, you have been the cause of unnecessary annoyance and expense to the settlers now, if you don't make that account of damages to each and every one of us within 10 days, you son of a bitch, we will suspend your animation between daylight and hell. Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island, visited the area and wrote the town lands of Monterey are all in the hands of a single man. How they came there is an obscure, vexatious question, and rightly or wrongly, the man is hated with a great hatred. His life has been repeatedly in danger. Not very long ago, I was told the stage was stopped three evenings in succession, by disguised horsemen thirsting for his blood. Calls were made to lynch and hang Jacks, and he had to take bodyguards with him wherever he went in the region. A great cheese named after an awful land baron. Among David Jack's many interests was a dairy on the Salinas River, there, he produced a cheese whose origins can be traced back to Franciscan friars, who had established missions in California, when it was still part of the Spanish Empire. Faced with an abundance of more fresh milk than they could consume, the friars converted it into a soft and creamy light delicacy that came to be known as queso blanco pais, white peasant cheese, or simply queso blanco, white cheese. It became a staple diet of California's Spanish-speaking settlers. Jacks became a partner in 14 of Northern California's biggest dairies. Like the Franciscans, he converted surplus milk into queso blanco, which he marketed as Jack's cheese. It proved to be a great crossover product. The Anglos liked it and before long, the white cheese was popular throughout the West Coast. People asked for it by name, and eventually Monterey Jack displaced Queso Blanco as the white creamy cheese's name. Nowadays daily production of Monterey Jack is in the tens of thousands of pounds, and it accounts for 10% of all of California's cheese production. Dewey of Library's Dewey Decimal System was an awful creep. The Me Too era brought attention to allegations of harassment and misconduct by many famous names. Noble Dewey, chief librarian at Columbia University, a founding member of the American Library Association, and the man after whom the Dewey Decimal Classification System used in libraries is named, does not appear in modern headlines. However, if he was alive today rather than nearly a century dead, he would have been front and center as one of the more awful perpetrators of predatory behavior and harassment. Dewey Long revered as the father of the modern library, made tons of inappropriate advances towards women, their numbers included many fellow librarians, and even his own daughter-in-law, who once fled his house to escape his overtures, said sexual harassment, coupled with rabid racism and vicious anti-Semitism, was excessive even by the sexist, racist, and anti-Semitic standards of his era. As seen below that kind of awful personal behavior, eventually got him kicked out of the very library association that he had helped found an innovative educator. Melville Louis Cossett Dewey, 1851 to 1931, was born and raised in New York. As a young man, he advocated for the reform and simplification of the English language, which entailed getting rid of redundant letters. By way of personal example, he changed his first name spelling from the Melville to Melville, and his last name from Dewey to Dui. Melville stuck but Dui did not. He got a bachelor's degree from Amherst in 1874, and was then immediately hired to manage its library and reclassify its collections. He built upon a decimal structure first outlined by Sir Francis Bacon centuries earlier, and copyrighted the Dewey Decimal Classification, EDC, now commonly known as the Dewey Decimal System in 1876. That year, while a graduate university student, he also founded the Library Bureau a Business to provide equipment and supplies to libraries. Its chief products were high-quality index cards that established the standard for library catalog cards and filing cabinets. In 1876 he also helped found the American Library Association, ALA, the world's oldest and largest library association, with over 57,000 members today. In 1883 he became Columbia University's chief librarian, and in 1888 he was made director of New York State Library. In 1895 he founded the Lake Placid Club, a recreation spot for educators to visit in pursuit of health and inspiration, at a low cost. Unfortunately the man's many positive contributions were marred by an awful side. A Great Librarian's Awful Side Melville Dewey was grabby, 
and one of his biographies referred to his old nemesis, a persistent inability to control himself around women, for decades from at least the 1880s, and until he was almost 80 years old and with one foot in the grave, Dewey persisted in a pattern of unwelcome hugging, unwelcome touching, certainly unwelcome kissing with female subordinates. When he opened a librarian course he taught at Columbia to women, Dewey required a photograph from each female applicant because, as he charmingly put it, you can't polish a pumpkin. In 1905, during a 10-day trip to Alaska sponsored by the American Library Association, he made unwelcome advances on at least four prominent librarians, who complained to officials, in the ensuing furor, he was forced to resign from the Alabama. In 1929, when he was 78 years old, Dewey had to shell out thousands of dollars, a significant chunk of change back then, to settle a lawsuit brought by a woman whom he had groped and kissed in public the previous summer. In addition to the awful sexism, Dewey was also an awful racist and awful anti-Semite, per a policy he wrote, the Lake Placid Club banned black people and Jews. He even bought land adjacent to the club to make sure that no Jews bought it. That triggered a petition to the New York State Board of Regents to remove him as state librarian. The board declined to remove him, but it did issue a public rebuke, and he resigned in 1905 as a result. Just how awful was Captain Bly? William Bly, 1754-1817, is depicted in popular culture as the epitome of a tyrannical boss and cruel commanding officer, as portrayed in cinematic and fictional accounts of the mutiny on the bounty, Bly was an awful, overbearing, and despotic captain. He reportedly overworked, mistreated, and insulted his men, and was a sadist who gratuitously punished any who triggered his insecurities, by flogging them to within an inch of their lives. Such cruel conduct, the commonly accepted narrative goes eventually drove his men to mutiny. In reality when viewed within the context and norms of his era, Bly was a pretty decent ship commander, he was not exactly a teddy bear, and he frequently subjected his men to tongue lashings. However most captains did the same back in those days. When it came to actual physical lashings, the Bly's men were flogged less frequently, than were their peers sailing under other captains. In other words, Bly preferred to chastise his crew verbally, instead of physically. Not only was Bly not a cruel captain, he was actually a conscientious one. Another way in which William Bly was better than most ship captains of his day is that, unlike many of his peers, he did not neglect his crew's well-being, Bly was not full of the warm and fuzzies, but he nonetheless felt a keen sense of duty and responsibility towards those under his command, and invested significant time and effort to keep his ship's company healthy. For example, he organized the ships aboard his ship to ensure that the men got plenty of rest, and oversaw a daily exercise regimen to keep them fit. Bly also saw to it that his crew got as highly nutritious a diet, as was possible under the circumstances, that his men eventually mutinied had little to with unbearable conditions, or an impossibly awful captain. The mutiny aboard HMS Bounty came about because, after an extremely long journey, the men had spent several weeks on leave in the tropical island paradise of Tahiti. There they had relaxed, let down their hair, and partied it up heartily with local women. The desire to keep the party going, rather than excessive oppression by an exceptionally mean captain, is what caused the mutiny. Captain Bly turned out to be an inspirational hero after the mutiny aboard the bounty. When the bounty finally weighed anchor and raised sails for the long journey back home, the jarring contrast between the drear ship life and the paradise they had left behind was too much for many of the ship's crew, so they decided to mutiny. On April 28, 1789, Disaffected sailors led by acting Lieutenant Fletcher Christian seized the ship, ditched Bly and 18 other sailors loyal to him on a 23-foot boat, gave them provisions for five days, cast them adrift, and returned to Tahiti. The deposed captain's conduct after the mutiny was actually inspirational. Bly and the men aboard his boat had been left to die in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles from civilization. Instead he demonstrated brilliant leadership under adversity. Bly kept his men alive and navigated the dinky boat nearly 4,000, until they reached civilization, all the while he battled thirst, hunger, illness, and the occasional hostile natives. It was one of the most extraordinary feats of seamanship in history. Just how awful was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact? On August 23, 1939, one week before the invasion of Poland that kicked off World War II, Nazi Germany and the Communist Soviet Union stunned the world, by signing a German-Soviet non-aggression treaty, 
better known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, ever since a widely accepted narrative has developed to the effect that the pact was an awful deal that proved to be disastrous for the USSR. When examined dispassionately, however in the context of the time, and from the perspective of the signatories, especially the Soviets it made sense. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was bad for the Western Allies, and was certainly awful for Poland, but it was a good deal for the USSR. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin subsequently proved disastrously, wrong in his faith that Hitler would honor the agreement, and in his stubborn refusal to heed warnings of an impending German attack in 1941. However the fault in that lay with Stalin not with the pact. The pact itself actually served the interests of the USSR, and while the Soviets did not make the best use of it, they were nonetheless better off for having signed it. From a Soviet perspective in 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact made good sense. From the perspective of the Western powers at the start of World War II, Britain and France and from a Polish perspective, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was calamitous, but from the perspective of the Soviet Union, the 1939 German-Soviet Non-Aggression Treaty made good sense. The Western powers had demonstrated their unreliability, during the Munich Crisis in 1938. They exhibited a greater distaste for dealing with Stalin than with Hitler. At the time the Soviets had made solid offers to defend Czechoslovakia, which Hitler threatened to invade, but they were rebuffed. Instead the Poles refused the Red Army permission to march, through Poland to reach Czechoslovakia, while Britain and France negotiated half-heartedly, and wrapped up the affair with an awful diplomatic debacle, in which they appeased Hitler by gifting him Czechoslovakia, now the modern-day Czech Republic. After Munich, the USSR had something to offer both sides. The Germans negotiated seriously and made attractive offers, while Britain and France did not. And the Poles in their dealings with the Soviet Union, the only country whose forces could actually physically come to their defense against the Germans, were astonishingly short-sighted. As things turned out the Soviets were better off for having signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact bought the Soviets nearly two years in which to prepare for war, poor as the Soviet military's performance was in 1941, it was even less prepared for war in 1939. Moreover, the pact which gave the USSR nearly half of Poland, pushed the Soviet borders hundreds of miles westwards, which gave the USSR that much additional buffer against the Nazis. Space and distance proved decisive to Soviet survival in 1941, the Germans came within 10 miles of the Kremlin before they were turned back. Without the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Germans would have launched their invasion, from a start line hundreds of miles further to the east. The same effort that ran out of steam within sight of the Kremlin, would likely have pushed far beyond had it started hundreds of miles closer to Moscow. As the Soviets saw it, they owed the Western powers and Poland nothing. Indeed they had outstanding border claims against Poland, the Germans offered to satisfy those claims, while the British and French offered little. The Soviets were the ones expected to do the bulk of the fighting, and dying in a war against Germany. So it struck them as chutzpah for Germany's foes, to offer so little in exchange for the high price the USSR would pay if it sided with them, rather than develop a relationship of benevolent neutrality with Germany. Was King John of England as awful as he is depicted in the Robin Hood legend? King John of England, 1166-1216, is best known as the bad guy from the Robin Hood legend, he is depicted as a cowardly usurper and awful sibling who constantly schemed to seize the throne, while his heroic brother, King Richard I the Lionheart, was away on God's work in the Crusades. While the reality was more complicated, and Richard was actually a bad king who detested England and the English, John was no saint. Among other things, he personally murdered his teenage nephew Arthur of Brittany in a drunken rage. Nonetheless John could also be quite a likable fellow when he wanted to be, the problem was that he often did not bother to even try. So his reign ended up a disastrous one for England. He lost his French holdings, got the Pope to excommunicate him, and place England under an interdiction, and triggered a baronial rebellion that ended with the Magna Carta. However all of that came about not because John was a cartoonishly evil king, but because he was an epically incompetent one. King John was not so much evil as he was incompetent. On his way back home from the Crusades, Richard the Lionheart was captured, and imprisoned by a powerful aristocrat whom he had offended in the Holy Lands. A huge ransom was demanded for Richard's release, and his brother John tried to take advantage of the situation to usurp the English throne. 
he bungled it and ended up banished and had his property confiscated, before a freed Richard finally forgave him. When he finally became king following his brother's death without issue, John entered into a disastrous marriage that cost him much of his holdings in France. He then got into a ruinous war with the French king that cost him the rest. At home John got into an argument with an archbishop, that ended up with the Pope excommunicating John and all of England. Even when he tried to do the right thing, and shifted some of the burden of taxation, from the peasants to the wealthy nobles, it backfired and led to a baronial rebellion that forced him to sign the Magna Carta. Fittingly his final days were just as pathetic, while suffering a bout of dysentery that would ultimately do him in. He decided to take a shortcut through some marshy ground by a tidal estuary. The tide came and John barely escaped drowning, but ended up losing his baggage train and the crown jewels of England. Was it actually unnecessary to atomically bomb Japan in World War II? One of the more persistent myths of the Second World War, as it that the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 was unnecessary, because Japan was already reeling and on the verge of surrender, the Allies simply had to blockade Japan, and the Japanese government would have come to its senses sooner rather than later, and thrown in the towel. A variety of factors make that theory nonsensical. The first is that the war when the atomic bombs were dropped was not limited to the Japanese home islands, and the choice of whether to invade or simply blockade them. Japan in August 1945, still occupied vast territories in Asia and the Pacific, and misgoverned hundreds of millions of conquered subjects, they endured daily horrors from their Japanese overlords, who subjected them to casual brutality, torture, rape, murder, and massacres. On average roughly 250,000 conquered civilians, a number greater than the estimated 200,000 fatalities caused by both the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombs, died every month as a result of awful Japanese barbarities those civilians would have continued to suffer and die each day, week, and month, that the war dragged on while the Allies waited for the Japanese authorities, to make up their minds about whether and when to surrender. Every day that World War II dragged on was another day in which thousands were killed and millions suffered. In the summer of 1945, Japan also had millions of soldiers stationed in her overseas empire in Asia and the Pacific, who were pitted against millions of Allied opponents. As a result, thousands of casualties were inflicted, and suffered by both sides each day. Every single day that passed while the Japanese home islands were blockaded in the hope that doing so would bring Japan's leaders to their senses, was another day in which thousands of Allied and Japanese soldiers were killed and wounded. In addition, the Japanese held hundreds of thousands of Allied POWs in the summer of 1945, Japan which had signed but not ratified the 1929 Geneva Convention on Prisoners of War, did not treat POWs in accordance with international agreements. Instead, POWs were subjected to barbaric treatment every single day, and were routinely beaten, starved, denied medical care and treatment or casually murdered. Casualties from continued fighting, and from Japan's atrocious treatment of POWs, would have continued to mount every single day that the war continued, while the Allies waited for Japan's surrender. The Empire of Japan's Awful Leaders the main reason however that debunks the take that, the atomic bombing of Japan was an awful mistake or atrocity is that the alternative would have been worse, not just for the Allies, whether soldiers engaged in combat with Japanese, civilians living under brutal Japanese occupation, or POWs in brutal Japanese captivity, but for the Japanese themselves. If Japan had not been shocked into immediate surrender with atomic bombs, the Allies would have had to conduct a massive invasion of the Japanese home islands. It was an invasion that Japan's leaders were determined to resist via national suicide, said leaders of the Empire of Japan, a morally bankrupt and cowardly lot. An awful bunch who refused to confront and accept the fact that they had made an awful mistake when they took their country into an unwinnable war, which they then lost. Ethical leaders would have shouldered the responsibility for the mess they got their country. Japan's leaders tried to escape their burden by histrionics and determined to immolate themselves and take their country with them.